The Utah Jazz, seemingly out of nowhere, are one of the hottest teams in the NBA. They are 9-1 in their last 10, including wins over the Nuggets and Bucks, and are shaping up to be yet another playoff contender in an already deep Western Conference. I and many expected this team to be near the bottom of the standings. While they have some level of talent led by all-star Lori Markkinen, I just thought their roster didn't stack up to many of the others in the West. Despite a mountain of doubt, this Jazz team is prevailing and currently playing as good as anyone in the league. Today I will be going over this insane Jazz stretch and how this team being competitive all of a sudden will impact the future of this franchise. Before we get into this, if y'all could like the video, sub the channel, and hit that noti bell, I would really, really appreciate it. It would help me out a ton, smaller NBA YouTuber trying to grow, and without further ado, let's get right into the video. While I'm going to do a deep dive into this roster, I'm going to start with this insane recent stretch. The Jazz have an offensive rating of 124.5 and, and a defensive rating of 112.1 during their 9-1 stretch, making for a net rating of 12.4 that would have them by far number one in the league. While this doesn't mean that they're the best team in the league, it displays that this 9-1 run has been dominant. They weren't squeaking out wins here and there, they were dominating teams from start to finish. This Jazz stretch included wins by 37 against the Mavs, 16 against the Bucks, 13 against the Nuggets, and 32 against the Raptors. This Utah team has shown up and showed out against the best of the best, and they are led by 26-year-old All-Star Laurie Markkinen. Laurie Markkinen is one of the most interesting stories in recent NBA history. While the former 7th overall pick definitely showed flashes in his early days in Chicago, averaging nearly 19 in his second year, he would not touch 15 a night for the next three seasons and became more or less an afterthought. He was deemed too small to play center but too slow to play power forward, and while he did still get paid with Cleveland, there is no way anyone saw this coming. Since his arrival in Utah, Lori has been one of the most dynamic floor spacers in the league. He did play the three some in Cleveland, but we really got to see Lori shine in that role in Utah. The tweener between four and five has now become a legit three or four, and he opens up the game for everyone. The seven footer has shot 39.3% from deep on about eight attempts a night since his arrival in Utah, while averaging 25, nine and two. You'd think these are two completely different players when comparing Chicago and Cleveland Lori to Utah Lori. While these aren't superstar numbers, Lori is solidifying his place as an all-star level guy in this league after being written off. Now for the hard part. Lori Markkinen has been the center of trade rumors recently, and let me play devil's advocate for a second. While I partially believe this is just Danny Ainge doing his due diligence, it could be more than that. While Lori is an outstanding talent, I think we can all agree that he can't be the best player on a championship team. While Lori is a great starting point for the Jazz, and I couldn't blame them for sticking with him, I can see why moving off him could be advantageous. You might be in a situation with Lori where he and Will Hardy make you eternally mediocre. You'll never be bad enough to get a franchise-changing prospect, but you'll never be good enough to compete for a title. It's a space that I would genuinely hate to be in as a sports fan, and one that could very easily become a reality for the Jazz should they keep Lori. Another thing we have to consider is that essentially the only route for Utah to obtain a superstar is through the draft. The reality of the situation is that it's not a top free agent destination. I've been to Utah, it's beautiful, but I don't think I need to explain why a superstar free agent going there is unlikely. Now listen, recent reports have suggested that the Jazz are committed to building around Lori, but as we know, things in this league change by the minute. If you are against trading Lori, I completely understand, but I feel like it's a point I have to discuss when talking about this Jazz team. While I don't think he'll get the five first rounders he's seeking, I think Danny Ainge could get a phenomenal package from a number of teams. Another thing that has to be considered with Lori's overall situation is his contract. He is currently making around 17 to 18 million and is under contract for this year and next. This is more reason to me to strike while the iron is hot and trade Lori right now. Not only will you have to pay him at least 40 to 45 million a year, but his value will sharply decline next year when his deal becomes expiring. I just don't see a path forward with Lori where the Jazz really build towards a championship and getting a haul of assets for him after the Mitchell and Gobert trades could be the final move truly needed for this Jazz rebuild. Let me be clear, Lori is absolutely worth that money, but I can see a situation like Bradley Beal's this past summer or Zach Levine's currently unfolding here. Danny Ainge and the Utah Jazz need to learn from mistakes in recent NBA history and pull the trigger. While Utah fans, I understand being hesitant to move one of your few beacons of hope. For the reasons I just explained, I really think it's the right move. Not only is his value peaking, but I think many contenders may be willing to empty the bank for him. This isn't a Laurie Markin and trade video, but I would feel like I was omitting something if I didn't mention it. I really think he ends up getting moved, and even if you don't want it, hopefully this can make you feel a little bit better if it were to happen. 
Laurie is far and away the best player on this team, but one all-star level guy doesn't make you win 9 out of 10. This Utah team has an assortment of role players that have been excelling lately. I'd love to talk about a ton of guys on this roster, but for the sake of time, I've decided to key in on two guys. Colin Sexton has been outstanding since being inserted into the starting lineup, and John Collins is starting to find his groove we saw in Atlanta again somewhat. Colin Sexton, like Laurie, has a pretty interesting story. The young guard averaged 24 a night in his third year in Cleveland and has gone downhill ever since. While this is partially due to injuries and partially due to the stigma against small guards who aren't great playmakers, it still confuses me. Regardless of what's gone down since his stellar third year, Sexton has been presented with opportunity again and he has taken full advantage. Since his insertion into the starting lineup on December 13th, Sexton is averaging 22-3-5 on 52-42-92, compared to 13-3-3 on 45-33-88 while coming off the bench. This has been great for not only Sexton, but also the man whose spot he took, Jordan Clarkson. We see the opposite effect here, with Clarkson averaging 24-6 on 45-32-93 since being moved to the bench, compared to 17-3-5 on 40-30-83 when starting. The Jazz clearly had their two on-ball scorers in the wrong spots, and fixing this has done wonders for this team. The stark differences for both when starting or not is kind of funny to me, and part of me wonders what they'd look like starting together. The John Collins trade was one that confused me and many. I was genuinely shocked that the Jazz did not get assets in return for taking on his contract. Not only this, but the assortment of big wings and bigs created partially as a result of this deal was also confusing. While Utah's roster construction was confusing to just about everyone, they've clearly figured it out and the John Collins redemption project is looking alright. While he is only averaging 13.8 a night compared to 13.1 last year, his efficiency is where we see him reestablishing himself. In five seasons prior to last season, Collins was a 37.6% three-point shooter on two and a half attempts a night. Last year, his numbers plummeted to 29.2% on 3.4 attempts. So far this season, Collins is shooting 38% on 3.6 attempts a night. While his rebounding numbers aren't quite at the double-digit levels they were early in his career, he has gotten back to 7.7 .7 from 6.5 a, a year ago. I don't know if he ever gets back to the 20 and 10 level he was once at, but the John Collins reclamation project is proving to be positive for Utah. They had to spend the money and now could potentially move off Collins for assets in the future. As I said, I would love to discuss this entire roster, but I'm not making a documentary here. I will say though, the Jazz appear to have found some diamonds in the rough and have a pretty solid supporting cast with plenty of spacing. You'd have to think at least two of Walker Kessler, THT, Keontae George, Taylor Hendricks, and Ochai Abaji become decent players. Identifying potential on a roster like Utah's is somewhat complicated, but they have a large amount of young prospects. While this Utah roster is centered around youth, Pieces like Kelly Olynyk and Chris Dunn are important as well. As I said, I would love to discuss a number of these guys, but that's how we get 30 minute videos that have half of you asleep at the 12th minute. While I think we can all agree this team is far from a finished product, I think Danny Ainge and Will Hardy have done an outstanding job reestablishing a culture in Utah. This is a young team with a war chest of draft assets and a real game changer in Laurie Markkinen. While he may be moved, this would make the Utah draft stash grow even more. We are a long, long way from the finish line, but I think Utah Jazz fans have a ton to be excited about. You have a coach and a front office and some young pieces currently to be excited about. I don't know if the people bringing Utah back to contention are on the roster right now, but I do know that Danny Ainge has set them up beautifully for what's to come. That's going to wrap this one up. If you all enjoyed it, please like it up, sub the channel, and hit that noti bell. Comment your thoughts down below on this Jazz stretch. You know what I mean? I, I mean, best team in the league. You know, no one else has gone 9-1. I believe the Clippers were 8-2. and two. Well, I mean, I, I think that was, or did they win last night? I forget. I honestly forget. But 9-1 in their last 10, looking like one of the best teams in basketball. Obviously, you know, that brings the Lori thing into question. That kind of, you know, these reports that are coming out now that they're going to build around him. I'm starting to think that Lori probably won't be moved. When I wrote this video, for the most part, funny luck, fun, fun luck. Funnily enough, I actually wrote it yesterday, and I was like, yeah, I, I, I still think he probably could get moved. You know, stuff changes by the minute in this league, as I said. But, you know, again, I, I think this Utah team is definitely, you know, again, I look at the Western Conference right now, and I look at, you have OKC, who's obviously already one of the best teams in the West. And then you have San Antonio, who is awful, awful. But they have, again, I, I dropped it. This is actually the first video I ever dropped on this channel was about the Spurs. You ought to go check that out. About the picks that they have. People don't know how many picks they have. But basically, I think them. And then you have Memphis, who's going to come back next season with, you know, Ja, Bain, Jaron, and probably a top five pick that, you know, they make that selection or trade it. To me, those three is like who I think is going to run the Western Conference. I think the Jazz aren't as far along as those teams. Because, you know, obviously, you know, San Antonio is worse than Utah right now. But they 
have Wembenyama. They have the guy who's going to become the guy. You know, Grizzlies, injured, you know, blah, blah, blah. But they have the guys, right? Those three teams have the guys. Utah is just, I mean, they have a guy. You know, they have a guy. They have, you know, some pieces. I think Sexton is, you know, a really good talent. But, you know, they don't have the superstar, superstar guy that, you know, again, I look at San Antonio, you have Wembenyama. OKC, you have Chet and Shea. Memphis, you have Ja. You know, I I, I don't know if... uh. You know, I, I think, you know, Bain and Jaron are all-star level guys right now. But I think, you know, I again, man, I, I think Chet is going to be unreal. Obviously, I think Wemby's going to be unreal. Uh, but, you know, I, I think both those guys will be better than Ja. But I don't know what that has to do with any of this conversation at all. But basically, this Utah team is going to be in that conversation. Like, if you know, they play their cards right. Again, even if they don't trade Lori, they still have a ton of draft assets. It's, you know, you, you know the, the, the purgatory thing. It's possible, but it's also, uh, you know, not possible. So, again, man, we'll see once again if y'all are still here. Y'all still here? Comment, uh, I, I don't know. What, what's around me? Comment Razor. I'm looking at a Razor mouse. Comment Razor, and I'll catch you on the next one. If you get the if you get the right Razor spelling, too, you're, you're like that. But, uh, yeah, I'm rambling. Peace.